So here we are finally at the first extended narrative we've considered that concerns King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and Lancelot and Guinevere and many of these other figures that we've kind of addressed in passing. And we're going to get into all of that and all of the comments about uh, Mallory, uh, Sir Thomas Mallory, that are um, in your Norton. This is what the full document looks like, by the way, if you're interested. Uh, so I didn't have you read all of this. And I also want to talk about how all of this relates to earlier versions of Arthur that we've seen from like Geoffrey of Monmouth and other writers and how fantastic and different things are here and also just how interesting the romance has become in terms of its relationship to power and I want to talk a little bit about that before we get done. I have earbuds on today so it's a bit easier to record the sound but anyway all of that aside let's just remember a few basic things from our previous lecture where I was talking about the romance and how it emerges as a storytelling tradition uh, primarily from people associated with French language and culture and regions of you know present-day France as well, um, and how we have these lays through uh, uh, writers like Mary de France, which speak to an oral tradition that extends well beyond uh, the time period that we are now looking at in the course, or well before the time period that we're looking at in the course. So we have this sense of this really powerful new storytelling format um, that's being you know very rapidly spread across uh, both the French and English speaking worlds. And we also keep in mind this idea that we have the myth of Arthur, but early on with Geoffrey of Monmouth and others, it's not this, it doesn't serve the romantic function. It's, it's not part of that, you know, tripart structure, introduction, complication, conclusion that is so significant to the lays and other tales. It there, as you're looking at it with Geoffrey of Monmouth, certainly, it's, it's a story that is there completely for purposes of power, purposes of, um, justifying a monarchy, justifying a chain of rulers who exist in a certain place and time. And it's also a way to reconcile primarily the Christian world with the pagan world. And that's an important term, uh, especially in the Mallory reading, which you will see everybody identify themselves as a Christian, which if you're thinking about it historically is slightly hilarious when you think about um, the period of time that's being addressed in this movement from the pagan world to the Christian world. Uh, but anyway, we're not dealing with real people, places, or things, so we can put that aside for a few moments. We're dealing with stories, and that's one of the reasons why this is going to be so interesting. Um, before we get into um, the selections from Mallory's book, I, I do want to address your Norton anthology I am the I am the first person, you know, the Norton and the Heath anthologies are kind of the primary professional literary anthologies. They're both very good. Um, they both do wonderful things, and they do a great job providing you with a lot of information in a succinct manner. But part of that requires these companies to just organize a lot of material, and not all the material is as good as, as other materials. I would really say this introductory material on Mallory should be taken with a big grain of salt, giant grain of salt. Um, not necessarily for its kind of factual imp implications, but some of the some of the observations that are made along the way are not particularly helpful. So yes, it is very important to know that Mallory uh, is more likely than not a prisoner uh, and is writing this while he has been imprisoned. And it's important to know that he is largely a political prisoner at the time. But what might not be obvious from a contemporary American perspective and might not be obvious from a contemporary kind of undergraduate American um, perspective is this idea that you know the legal system that has imprisoned Mallory is um, you know some well-oiled machine uh, which you know you might have some sense of. Certainly, there are enormous amount of issues with the legal system in present-day America. You don't need to know much about incarceration rates across different ethnic groups to see that there might be something wrong, or there almost certainly is something wrong with how we treat and incarcerate people in the United States. But that aside, when you when you when you hear about Mallory and you hear about the charges of you know he was breaking and entering into religious institutions and he's accused of the crime of rape and he's accused of um, you know being a brawler essentially and starting and starting physical fights um, I cannot say he did not do those things I cannot say he did those do those things I do know that I have about as much faith in the legal system that incarcerated him as I would a unicorn driving a school bus. So um, you got to take it with a grain of salt. And I say all of that just so you don't encounter Mallory and think, well, he's guilty of these hideous crimes. I don't want to ever consider 
uh, his work or I'm not going to read his work. You need to understand the context that he's coming from and you need to understand who's getting to write the historical record. And this gets me to my second major significant issue with the Norton's treatment of uh, Mallory. It makes this fantastically inaccurate claim that Mallory essentially wouldn't have understood the difference between the romance and our conception of history or a conception of history and that makes absolutely no sense. We know that people, particularly literate people, would have been well aware of chronicles, records, um, and the factuality of, uh, or potential factuality of them. So to say that Mallory kind of wanders through life um, in an insane frame of mind where he would think that what happens in these Arthurian legends is real is, is simply balderdash. How do I know that? Because he writes in the romantic structure so frequently. And the romantic structure is a storytelling format, as Mary de France makes very clear to us. Uh, this is not an individual who imagines he is recording history as in you know, a series of events that would lead up to his incarceration in some prison. Uh, that would be a completely berserk perspective, and it really undermines what is so fantastic and wonderful, wonderful about him, regardless of all the other things that may or may not have happened. It's his ability to very clearly articulate this story in a way that, while we may have difficulty with parts of it, is very, very persuasive and very, very entertaining for a lot of people for a long period of time. And that does not just happen by somebody writing down, here's what I think happened last week. It works because you have a master storyteller drawing from a selection of excellent texts, which are cited continually throughout the document, and they are woven into this long narrative tale, okay? We also know that it gets edited in some ways by Caxton, uh, the printer, uh, who's a, you know, an important name to know if you're an English major. Um, but we don't want to look at Mallory and say, you know, here's this miserable criminal who you know, would have thought that uh, if he went to the right lake, he could find Excalibur. Uh, he's clearly operating in the fantastic mode. Um, and he's clearly aware of it. So anyway, I just wanted to talk about that for a few minutes. I know that took a little bit of time, but it, it should get you into the position of, you know, when you're reading literature, understanding that um, uh, you need to make interpretations and you need to make values based on what you read. And every English major learns that commentary is wonderful, but it is always only commentary. And it can be very insightful and helpful, but ultimately, you know, you have to rationalize a, a position for yourself and a commentary can be extraordinarily beneficial to your reading, um, but you don't want it to cloud your experience of the text. And it's that fundamental engagement with the text that is valuable ultimately um, because the commentators, including myself and everybody else, will long fade away, will long be forgotten, and many of these texts will still persist. So keep an eye on that going forward. All that aside, Norton's a good document. Norton's a good anthology. Okay, so... We're now at a position where we can look at these selections from the Arthurian legends and we can begin to see some really interesting things. And what we're starting to see is obviously this very kind of scandalous um, situation where Lancelot and uh, Guinevere are you know, having a romantic relationship and the king doesn't know and it's found out by Mordred and other knights and it leads to all this conflict within the kingdom. Um, I'm not going to go through all the plot points. I'll mention some along the way. Clearly you're going to be reading this yourself. But let's think a little bit about what's happening here, why it's so fantastic, because there's something maybe going on just under the surface that once you kind of pull up the rock might kind of blow your mind in terms of why the story is so important. So when you look at this story, we have we have we have all of these, we have all of these, it's important to understand that this story is a very long piece, obviously, right? And you're seeing selections from it, and there are lots of parts of this that fit the romantic structure that we've been talking about. Um, and obviously the ending of this story is more like Tristan and his old, except it's Lancelot and Guinevere, uh, than it is, uh, you know, um, Maloon or something like that. But who's the victim here? Uh, and, and maybe victim is the wrong word, but one of the things I want to draw your attention to is how awful things are for King Arthur uh, in all the selections that you read, right? Arthur is presented to you, and he makes some comments along the way that make it hard to love him, but, he, but he's presented to you as this individual who is, um, you know, he's, he's, he's betrayed by his best knight. Um, his, his wife is having an affair. Um, he 
Uh, most of his men, a huge selection of his men, also betray him when they organize this this, this assault, and then later in the text as well. Um, he um, is warned of his potential death. He does everything he can to, to forestall his death. He has this, this incident with a snake biting the knight, sets off this enormous war that ends up with this incredibly gruesome death scene, right, where he stabs Mordred through with his spear, and Mordred hits him in the head, clear to the brain, as we're told in this story, with his sword. Um, and then they would imagine kind of yank the sword out of his head. And then he has to go off and, you know, die somewhere after all of this dramatic business with the, with the, with the getting rid of the sword and, and all of those things. Um, but things don't go well for him. And that's amazing. Because if you think about some earlier stories that we've read, both in this class or if you had me in... Um, uh, the history of the English language, one of the things that, that rarely happens in those early stories is that uh, we, have, we have these figures, these, these king figures, who are people who end up kind of losing or who are um, undermined by fate and fortune and circumstance and betrayed to some point of complete tragedy. We haven't run into that a lot um, in this course in terms of the kinds of people that we've been engaging in the kinds of stories that we've been reading. I mean, look at Beowulf for a second, if you've read Beowulf, and ask yourself, you know, could this have happened to Beowulf? You know, could Beowulf has, 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 have uh, suffered Arthur's fate? Um, Beowulf, you know, that's a ruin it for you, dies in the end, but he dies through a heroic action of his own design, uh, proving his manliness. Um, he's overwhelmed by the dragon and, and burned to death, uh, eventually dies from his burns. Uh, but Arthur seems to be a fate of cir uh, a victim of circumstance. Why is that important? The romance. It's the romantic storytelling mode. And one of the reasons it's so popular is because many early versions of it, which would have been spread to readers and listeners alike, you know, dramatize rulers, uh, people in power, aristocrats, knights, other significant members of society, essentially, undergoing extreme misfortune. Uh, power structures crumble in romantic narratives. And you can watch that with what, you know, some uh, schadenfreude, uh, to use the German word, if you're on the outside of the power structure and you look in and you see King Arthur, you know, deteriorating and you can feel sad about it. Or if you're a peasant who's lived under the boot heels of an aristocracy your whole life, you might be kind of like, that's not so bad. I kind of like seeing that happen. Um, even though you feel bad for the characters involved. But in the romance, we have this incredibly powerful commentary on power structures, on the aristocracy, on the rulers in the world. And again, this is another really close correlation that you can make between like modern day soap operas or, you know, nightly dramas, not like workplace dramas like CSI, but, um, you know, uh, m you know, you might take a, a, a series like Mad Men or you might take, you know, oh, any number of other series and you see these very beautiful, very well-dressed, very well-spoken, very articulate people who couldn't, couldn't get their lives together if their lives depended on it. There's always these negative things happening to them. Um, and I'm not saying you, we, we enjoy the romance just because we get to see beautiful people you know, falling down and, and be destroyed in the end in some cases. But I'm saying it is part of this structure. And it is important to know about because it is striking that when we first start getting these really popular tales, you know, they're not about common everyday people. They're about these remarkable people in society. And so when you look at, uh, when you look at Mallory's work, that really has to be in the back of your mind. You have all these knights who are messing up. You have all of these, you know, these kings and these rulers who are struggling mightily to, to survive and are failing continually. And it's also really interesting that they continually in this text identify themselves as Christian. Uh, I'm a Christian king. Uh, she's my Christian queen. Uh, there's all these questions around Lancelot's death about whether or not God, you know, would judge him harshly for being at uh, Guinevere's grave uh, because of the sin of adultery that they've committed. Um, there's all these in continual in evocations of faith um, as a shield against fate and fortune and mishap. And again, this is very different than what you would find in earlier works um, where a, a king or a queen or a ruler or a knight would, simple, would simply assert their right to do what they do. Uh, and there would be very little uh, contextualizing um, uh, theological framework. And again, I, I would reference Beowulf as the prime example, uh, a story that's probably written about 600 years before we get to, uh, to Mallory's work um, in which Beowulf has this, you know, this kind of Germanic uh, Nordic hero um, is uh, simply going to 
tell you that he is the greatest and the most powerful. Now, in the translations that we get of Beowulf, it's also the case that a lot of Christian theology gets woven in, but in the original oral tale, none of that would have been there. Um, so that's important to know. But to bring it back to what you've read, it's fascinating to look at the romance and see how the romance can be used to, to comment on to, and to critique power structures. Okay, uh, let's talk about another reason why this is so significant. Um, Arthur, Lancelot, and Guinevere's continual self-identifications as Christians is important precisely because of the situation that's going on. So it's this issue with adultery. Um, it's this issue with the marriage contract between Guinevere and Arthur. And Lancelot's actions and Guinevere's actions violate that sacred treaty. And that is one of the reasons why it's so significant. I'm not saying that kind of relationship would not raise a few eyebrows outside of Christendom at the time. Certainly, it would have. Uh, but it's significant to what's going on and why the people are 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 so intense, like Mordred and others, on outing uh, outing this situation in a very public, uh, very public way. So, so the, all of that's fascinating, and, and it's also fascinating when you get to the end of this and you see that what we have here is a whole different power dynamic, where the original story of Arthur from Geoffrey of Monmouth puts him in place in time for the line of you know, rulers who would follow him. In, in his death, we have the establishment of really um, uh, an argument for the Crusades. Okay, so who do we have identified at the end of this piece? Well, we have the Turks. We have all of these knights who are now heading eastwards uh, towards and to the Holy Lands, uh, where we know there is an enormous calamity that will take place over an extended period of time involving this clash of um, uh, those who adhere to the uh, to identify as Muslims or the Muslim faith or Islam, whichever term you want to use here, and those who identify as you know Christians, and we have this incredibly violent period of time. If you know anything about that, I won't talk about it here. But notice how the story of Arthur is used to justify um, the world of the storyteller. Even though Geoffrey of Monmouth writes it long before, you know he throws this story into the past, and it sticks. Uh, as a way to justify the, the procession and secession of British rulers over time. And then, and then um, Mallory, sitting in his prison cell, uh, perhaps, uh, throws it into the future, essentially saying, you know, well, still talking about the past, but he's like, yeah, all this happened and it set up, you know, the Crusades. Uh, so now we have this kind of fantasy framework for the Crusades, which is the subject I would strongly encourage you to look into if you don't know anything about it and you're interested in the Western world and in contemporary society as well. Um, some very pertinent themes um, in that subject to think about. But anyway, when we get done uh, our selection from um, uh, the death of Arthur, there's some things we need to maybe think about in terms of kind of bringing some ideas together. Notice how frequently Mallory uh, talks about citing... Um, the, the right French books, uh, the French histories, uh, the French texts that have all of the good source material. This is, you know, English major 101 material here. He's citing his sources continually. Um, he's letting you know where the information comes from. He's continually saying, you know, I'm looking and I'm scouring and I'm trying to find um, other details that may relate to these characters after this point, but there doesn't seem to be anybody out there. This is, this is a fascinating literary move because it speaks to the authority that he's trying to to bring to his own work, right? Because what Mallory's doing is he's drawing together all these pre-existing tales, which is exactly what we've been talking about all semester, and he's, he's creating something new with them. Um, how much of this should be considered, you know, just transcription of other texts? How much of it can be considered kind of his invention? Um, it's a very difficult question to, to figure out the answer to, but we have all this wonderful dialogue um, we have all of these wonderful exchanges, these really romantic images that kind of come up. Arthur and Mordred's death lock, like that, that hideous as it may be, is one of the most famous images um, in, in literature. Uh, Mordred like yanking himself down, his, down the spear so he can hit, his, you know, hit Arthur in the head with the sword. Um, that sense of fatality, that sense of brutality, that sense of just how unfair things are, um, even for the really, really elite members of society is is fascinating and we get that in this story did he make it up did he steal it from someone did he repackage it um, all we know is that there are multiple versions of the Arthurian legend and the knights who become associated with Arthur pre-existing this text and there are documents that strongly parallel it but we don't know what Mallory had in his prison cell and what he didn't have in his prison cell uh, so 
that's an interesting question, I think, to kind of keep in the back of your minds if you're interested in pursuing the subject more. So let's just think a little bit about where we are at this point with Arthur and where we're going to go with, 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 uh, with writers like John Skelton kind of coming up. Um, what we've seen is the romance transform from um, this storytelling mode, which is good for a little, it's good for entertainment, um, and it's you know very easy to di digest, and people enjoy it quite a bit. To this this format, these this massive again massive format that gives us something that's very entertaining, um, but it's also a commentary on power. It's a commentary on, on, on relationships between men and women. And it's a commentary on the significance of religion to our everyday life and the significance of magic to our everyday life and the world that we choose to live in and the world that comes to us regardless of what we do choose. And these are all fundamental concerns um, for um, not just the people that we're uh, reading about in the story, but also to the humanities um, itself. And so it's a really neat text. A lot of people knock it around because Mallory's not a great writer. Uh, you know, the, the, the prose is pretty flat. Um, the descriptions are pretty spare. Uh, but what he gives us is essentially this, uh, like a jungle gym, uh, imaginative jungle gym to play around in. So, you know, when they come to get Lancelot in Guinevere's bedroom, it's not much that's described. And Mallory's really not capable of describing it very well. But you can see that, right? You can see it in your head. You can imagine Lancelot at the door, knocking down the knights one by one, stealing the armor. You can see him walking through the halls with his sword hidden under his arm. You can see all of these things. And that's the gift of the romance, is that it sets up this wonderful framework that then you can breathe some life into. And it's that, it's that feeling of, of being part of the creation of the text that is, I think, what strikes people as so significant in, in romantic narratives, prose narratives, um, you know, visual narratives. It's a, different, it's a different deal. and We can discuss that at a later point, perhaps. But certainly when you're reading a story, when you're reading the romance in this style, uh, you have that imaginative potential, which, which you might not have in a, work, in a book. It features people, places, and things you don't understand. That includes vocabulary you can't comprehend, and that doesn't have plot structures that resonate with your, you know, your experiences with other narratives. So it's it's a valuable text. It's a wonderful text. Um, I'm saying you don't have to agree. You could have hated it. That, that's possible. And if you did, I hope you tell me, and I hope you tell me why. Um, and that's perfectly cool too. But in terms of you know what we've done here in the past four weeks, um, four or five weeks, wherever we are right now. What I hope you see, have seen is this development of a storytelling tradition. There could have been many other things that we focused on. For example, I left Chaucer out in the cold. Uh, we didn't even talk about Geoffrey Chaucer and his contributions. And I'll, I'll be talking about him a little bit more going forward um, and about the development of, of, of poetry, uh, which is pretty significant as well in the English language. But for now, you know, if you've, you've now seen how the Arthurian legend came about, and if you're interested in it, you know, you're not going to have to look far to run into more uh, references to it in popular culture. In your daily life, um, probably, you'll run into references to it. So there we go. I did want to say a little bit more about the significance of Tristan and Isolde uh, to this storytelling structure. Certainly Guinevere and Lancelot can be seen as these kind of romantic, this, this romantic despairing couple. Um, and I think Mallory and other authors are certainly drawing from that tradition. Um, but more on that maybe in the future. Anyway, I hope you, re hope you enjoy reading it if you haven't read it yet. And I uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say about it. So have a great day. Bye.